we're going to be looking at direct memory access and then IO software. So let's start off with direct memory access. So the sole purpose of direct memory access is to help the CPU interact with slow I.O. devices. Its goal is to make sure that the CPU doesn't busy wait, trying to figure out uh, what's happening when it's transferring data into the I.O. device. So think of it as an offload engine. The CPU offloads the work or outsources the work of transferring data to the I.O. device to the DMA. So the device controller reads data from the device. It interrupts the CPU. Um, if you didn't have DMA, then it would interrupt the CPU whenever data, or byte, or block is available. And then CPU reads the controller's buffer into main memory. And this leads to a whole bunch of interruptions that are too expensive to deal with. And if you add DMA access, then what happens is the whole thing is simplified. So your DMA controller uh, is given the information about what data to be trans transferred. And then the CPU programs the DMA and where to transfer it to. Uh, and then the DMA interrupts the CPU only when the whole transfer has occurred. Okay. So the overall operation would look something like this. So in this case, we're transferring data from disk to main memory. So what the CPU first does is programs the controller registers and then points it to the buffer source. Okay. And then the C DMA takes care of iterating over the buffer and then transferring it one byte by byte into memory. When it's done, the, this controller acknowledges that the transfer has happened, and then finally, the DMA uh, interrupts the CPU. So if you look at this, if you have a gigabyte of file to be transferred, the number of interruptions is just one. If you have two gigabytes, it's one. It's still one. It's always, uh, for every um, DMA programming, it needs, the CPU itself needs to be interrupted just once. So DMAs operate, notice that DMAs uh, share the memory bus, so they, can, they talk to the main memory, at the same time the CPU also talks to the main memory. Right? And so in such cases, uh, what happens is there are two, this shared bus becomes a contender resource and DMA operates in two modes. The first one is word at a time or cycle ceiling where the DMA acquires the bus transfers the word, and then releases the bus immediately. And the CPU waits for the bus if the data is being transferred. And so in this case, you occasionally steal a bus cycle from the CPU. Okay. And the burst mode is the one in which DMA holds the bus for a series of transfers. This is more efficient uh, since acquiring the bus takes time, and you're not constantly uh, going back and forth to the CPU on who has the bus. So you don't, you're, you're, you're reducing the arbitration cost. But it obviously locks down this uh, bus, and this might be inopportune for the CPU because it may be in a critical memory axis, which now gets queued up behind the DMA axis. So normally, an, uh, a, tradition, a technique to, that's used is you, DMAs operate in burst mode, but then they get deprioritized on the bus. The next thing we're going to be looking at is I/O software. So. First, we're going to be dealing with the types of I/O, and then uh, the kinds of uh, the types of I/O interaction. So, the first type of I/O is just synchronous I/O, or programmed I/O, which essentially busy waits. Uh, uh, that is, it keeps polling the I/O device until the I/O is complete. The next one is asynchronous or interrupted I/O, where the CPU issues a command uh, to the I/O device, and then CPU enters the wait state and it continues or could continue with other processing from other applications. And the I.O. device generates an interrupt when it comes back. And finally, there's the direct memory access, which is also can be considered as an asynchronous form of I.O. So with interrupts, you generally have an interrupt controller into which all I.O. devices hang on to. And the CPU, at any given time, when they want to inform the CPU about something, they would generate an interrupt. And CPU acknowledges the interrupt immediately, notes it down in the meantime to make sure that it knows what has happened, and then subsequently processes it later. So if you look at the way the, the interrupt processing in general works, so first, the I.O. device raises an interrupt by signaling on the bus line. Uh, there could be possibly multiple interrupts happening at the same time, for instance, a keyboard and a mouse. In this case, the one with the higher priority goes first. Uh, the, finally, the interrupt controller interrupts the CPU, 
puts the device address uh, on the address lines and then also informs the, um, the CPU about some information about what uh, the interrupt was per related to. And then the device number itself essentially looks up the giant table which has a specific set of numbers for different types of devices and then it's it's essentially a jump table. So you look at the the number, the corresponding function pointer and invoke the function. Okay. So let's look at a program where the way to write a string to a printer. Okay. So the string, the buffer to be dumped out into the printer is currently contained in the user line. And what we first do is transfer it into kernel space. And then the kernel space uh, is going to loop over this buffer byte by byte, checking if the printer is ready and putting it out onto the uh, printer. So if you look at this, there are two sources of inefficiency here. One is that it's doing it byte by byte. And the other is the polling, constant polling. So there's the polling to figure out if the printer is ready that is done with the given byte. And there's the byte by byte transfer into the printer. Okay. So let's look at ways to make this uh, more efficient. Interrupt driven IO gets rid of the polling. So what happens is in this case, uh, it goes through a two-step process. The first one is I'm going to put out a character onto the screen and note the fact that I put it out onto the printer. And I acknowledge the interrupt the, and then proceed. When the printer is done with that character, it's going to trigger this function again. And it's going to start from the top. And if the count is zero, then I'm done with the printing. I'm going to unblock the user. If not, I put out another character onto the screen, acknowledge, and then return from the interrupt. So in this case, I get rid of this busy waiting. So another way of doing this is also with the DMA, where essentially you, know, you get rid of the loop to transfer the data buffer byte by byte. So you set up the DMA controller to feed things into a printer, and then invoke the scheduler to go do something else. And what the DMA will take care of is to go through byte by byte to make sure that it's all fed into the printer. And when it's finally done, it's going to raise an acknowledge and uh, it's going to raise the interrupt handler. You acknowledge it and you unblock the user and you return from the interrupt. So you don't need to poll to figure out if the thing is done and you don't need to transfer it byte by byte. The DMA takes care of the iterator itself. So IO software layers uh, come in multiple layers. So first you've got the user level IO software then you've got your device independent IO software. Then you've got the device drivers, which is what we'll be looking at, and then the interrupt handlers. So the device independent is software was the interface we were talking about where you're using either programmed or synchronous or asynchronous IO to interact with the IO device. User level IO software is all the stuff that's inside the application, all the clean interface, for example, file style interface uh, that you export that you use to access all the IO devices. There's also the device specific aspect, which is uh, the software that's specific to every hardware that you plug into the, every IO device that you plug in. And that's known as the device drivers. Let's start off with the interrupt handlers. So interrupt handlers uh, are deep inside the operating system. And essentially they are a way for the IO device, the slow IO device to interact with the CPU. So normally what happens is the device driver starts the IO and then blocks. Okay, and an interrupt wakes up the driver again when it's done. When it's processing an interrupt, uh, first of all, it saves the current context to figure out where to return to. It sets up the new context in order to process the interrupt itself. And then it runs the handler. Usually the handler is blocked and there's nothing else that can happen in the system in the meantime. So the handler has to be really short. It notes down information about the interrupt and what the device's current status is before it returns. Finally, it chooses the process to run next and moves on. So the logical position of the device driver in conjunction with the interrupts is right about the hardware. So the interrupts uh, occur here and the device drivers are a level above and then you've got the rest of the OS. So this, it's at the lowest level in the software stack. So if you look at it 
to look at the overall flow of the I.O. subsystem. User level I.O. subsystem deals with things like how to make I.O. calls, formatting the I.O., things like spooling and buffering for higher levels of the application. Device independent I.O. Soft OS software essentially deals with the naming, the protection, the arbitration, the buffering for, for performance, the allocation of I.O. devices to specific processes. Device drivers are specific to hardware. They're mostly written by people who build the hardware themselves. And they are used, they are specific, they deal with the specifics of the devices. For example, monitors have specific settings that others want to stone, and the device driver deals with a lot of these. Interrupt handlers wake up the driver driver when the I.O. is complete. They are specific to the type of CPU that's designed. So one interesting question is, how do you install device drivers? There are commonly two ways of doing this. One is uh, you can either recompile and relink against the kernel, so the drivers are part of the OS and they're a single binary. Another option that's commonly used is to dynamically load it as a module during OS initialization. In such cases, the modules have to be, the device drivers have to be built separately and link it against a specific version of the kernel source. And these are often used when devices change often, so you plug and play certain devices. In such cases, you don't want that code lying around in the kernel all the time because you want to keep the kernel itself by tweet. You don't want to fatten the binary. And finally, there's the, the dynamically loaded during operation, which is a version um, that's used when for plug and play devices such as USB. So the, there are two kinds of dynamic loading, one which is done during OS initialization, another one which is done when the OS is already booted up. So the functions of device drivers are specific to the hardware, but typically they accept read and write requests. So all read and write requests eventually go through the device driver. For example, there's a circular buffer uh, in the network card in order to handle packets. Okay? They check the status and initialize the device if necessary. And they also issue a sequence of commands that are related to um, block and waiting for the interrupt. And they check for errors and return data. So they are the first line of checking for errors and returning data back to the CPU. Device independent I.O. software essentially performs I.O. functions common to all devices. So they try to provide a uniform interface to the device, uh, device drivers themselves. Uh, so they perform things like, uh, for example, exporting a character style interface or a block style interface to the upper, to the high levels of software. They deal with things like buffering and error reporting as well. And they also uh, do things like allocating I.O. devices to specific processes. So for example, things like GPUs, if you want exclusive control of the device, uh, then you've got, you've got to go through this device independent I.O. software that's going to lock down the device. So the uniform interfacing for device drivers um, is necessary so that uh, if you have a new device, you don't need to modify the operating system itself. And in some ways, it's easy also to provide the same interface for all drivers for similar hardware. For example, it doesn't really matter which type of keyboard you use. Right? In reality, they're not absolutely identical, but most functions are common between a lot of the devices, which is why it makes it possible uh, to design these uniform interfaces. It also helps name I.O. devices in a uniform way. So, for example, it helps to map symbolic names onto the proper driver. So, it helps you look at, if you have five USB sticks plugged in, and it helps you look at each USB, uh, the numbering, and then provide a file-like interface to that. While the goal would be to have a uniform interfacing um, here's an example as to what it, a standard driver interface achieves. If you don't have a standard driver interface, then there will be lots of places where the kernel reaches into the uh, driver subsystem when the driver reaches into the OS. And this makes tracking down bugs really hard. On the other hand, if you had a standard interface, then you notice that irrespective of what type of device driver it is, whether they're all treated as block devices, right? and the functions that interact with the device driver itself are fixed. So there are a fixed set of functions um, through which the OS interacts with the device drivers, and it's easier to track on the data flow and the bugs.
An interesting issue that arises with uh, I.O. devices is buffering. So buffering is mainly for performance purposes. And we look at all the different kinds of buffers that systems normally use. So the motivation is consider a process that wants to read data from the network, right? So the user process handles one character at a time. It blocks if the character is not available, and each arriving character causes an interrupt. So this goes back to the earlier example we discussed where the, we were trying to put out things onto the printer, and the, every um, character interrupted the CPU. Right? So each character causes. So this is the reverse. And in this case, what we want to really do is bu bunch up all of the character reads and then interrupt the CPU once and for all. Right? So we want to batch process things. So buffering essentially can be set up at the user level or the kernel level. Uh, user process typically set up buffers in the user space and the user process wakes up only if the buffer is filled up by the interrupt service procedure. So it sets up the buffer, gives it to the kernel, and then feeds it, and then waits on on until the buffer becomes full. And once the buffer becomes full, then the kernel will interrupt the user process. An interesting question is, can the buffer be paged out to the disk? The challenge is that if it's paged out to the disk, then the OS doesn't know where to put the character, you know, incoming character, right? There's an incoming character from the network that's needs that's been sucked out and needs to be put somewhere temporarily. Right? So the challenge is where do you put the character? Normally, uh, such user space buffers are locked down and we're locking in um, the number of the pool of pages shrinks, but then uh, incoming characters will always find space. There's also buffering in the kernel where uh, the interrupt handler puts characters in the buffers in the kernel. The kernel buffers are never paged out to the disk. And when full, you copy the kernel buffer to the user buffer. And the challenge though is what to do with newly arrived character when the user space page is being loaded from the kernel, from the disk, right? So we've said that the kernel space is, you don't have to page it, but then the user, this one could be in disk, right? And so in such cases, the question is what do you do? So there are different ways of interacting with this. A normal technique is for performance purposes is known as double buffering, where you have a switch. So when one of the buffers, kernel buffers becomes full and is being transferred to the user space, the another buffer starts to read from the so this side of the IO device. So when one kernel buffer is transferring data onto the user space, the other kernel buffer is used to buffer the IO device. It's possible that that may also fill up. Uh, in which case you need a third one. But typically two kernel buffers suffices uh, and buffers are used in turn. And so when the next time when this one uh, switches in the Samsung user level, this one starts reading from the I.O. device. So this kind of decouples the two systems. At any given time, the I.O. device is accessing one of the buffers while the, while the, use, the transfers to CPU happen from the other buffer. So there is no concurrency on that. Data buffering although good for latency purposes is not always good because it slows down things in the critical part. So you, if you look at this system, process A needs to copy from user to kernel space and kernel to the network. The network itself in, introduces latency by buffering and batching thing. Then the network buffers and then the NIC on the other side and the network control on the other side buffers. And then which transfers to the kernel and then that transfers to the user line. So if you look at it, they want to uh, three, four, five, six cop buffer copies happening in the system, and that in, in turn introduces latency delays of its own. And so if you have many sequential buffering, each one adds a delay on the critical part.